be wise of me to mention that, especially because there's some people that probably have discovered video for the first time or discovered me sharing these evotionals, devotionals, these videos of the reality of having and sharing Jesus in an intimate and personal way that there's also other things that we do with video. <laughs> but during the summer we kind of postpone those and set those aside because a lot of people take vacations and they're not really into studying or learning or growing and developing their personal relationship with God in a pragmatic and we would say dogmatic but in a practical way that would be consistent and persistent with the Word of God meaning that you go through from Genesis to Revelation or that you go through some type of systematic way of understanding by way of programming your mind by renewing it in some way that the Holy Spirit gives you some understanding and some comprehension and we call that learning you see there's a learning process that we go through each one of us as human beings <clears throat> we relate information that information is taken inside and processed in such a way that based upon your experiences and based upon your usage of that information it becomes knowledge for knowledge to actually become wisdom it has to be applied in some way you have to make it real to yourself and that's what the Holy Spirit does so God the Holy Spirit is always our teacher but we do actually have principles of life and other things that we're dealing in con conflicts as an adults. We're using the uh, basic youth conflict seminars in order to teach and to explain how we all have conflict. We're all dealing with conversation, but one of the issues we have in our conversation, as the King James calls it, which conversation in the King James means more than communication. It means your lifestyle choices and the way that you adapt to a person and you relate to them. But the way that we teach each other and the way that we communicate often runs into conflict because we don't cooperate in trying to resolve those conflicts. And so in basic youth conflicts, they teach you how to recognize certain things and certain principles that you can put into life that might cause your living experience to become better at what you're doing. And so in Principles of Life, we're not a motivational speaker. God knows that would be easy to do because, frankly, motivational speakers are a dime a dozen. And it's not that hard to, quite frankly, try to inspire someone. I mean, it's easy to do. And God bless those uh, motivational speakers that are real, but for me, most of them just seem like charlatans. So no offense to them, but I don't buy it unless it's scriptural. But for the rest of us, when we look at the Bible and we look at what God has to say, there are certain things that are true, and so we take that into video by discussing principles of life that we can use in our life in order to deal with conflict. And that's just one of what I now call video classroom. And we're probably going to change the format of the classroom, meaning just the outline that you know you see on the web. You know you'll. You look and see sometimes that some say Vidivo Light, Vidivo Tozer Teaching, Vidivo uh, Today, Vidivo Meditation, Vidivo... I don't think I have Vidivo Devotion, but anyways. The point of it being is that each one is stylized particularly for a different area in someone's life coming from a different type of ministry in that area of life. For instance, like... Video streams in the night comes from, or video songs in the night comes from streams in the desert, which particularly deals with the topic of suffering. Well, in the winter months, usually after summer, we come back to the classroom. And so I wanted to kind of put a shameless plug in for the classroom. Yes, we are still doing it. <laughs> but since we're talking about the classroom, it just wouldn't be a classroom without doing something on it, now would it? And one of the things that a friend of mine was really impressed with that I thought maybe I would show everyone just as an uh, example of what we do in video classroom. It isn't just about you know only Bible study, although that is the most important part of it. There are other things that we do that make the principles of life and that make life more enjoyable and living. And we will be getting into, in video class, I think that's what we'll just call it, video class, we'll be have different topics, different subjects, you know, that we want to discuss, and marriage is one of them. And so the 
basic principle, the number one principle that I teach in marriage, video marriage, is this. It's called the triangle principle. And it's just simply triangle. Pretty simple, right? You can take a triangle you know, and do it just like this. The interesting thing is there's two people in the triangle, or maybe three. There is, of course, the most important part. You. You are, after all, in some ways, a very important person to you, aren't you? There is another person also that's involved in this triangle. God. And lastly, there is someone else involved in this triangle that you might want to consider. And I don't know if you can see that because of this fan, but we'll try to kick the fan out of the way real quick. So you kind of get an example of it. Your spouse, you know, somebody that you consider marrying or you want to marry. And it's often interesting to me is that we have a lot of learning to do about what the reality of a marriage is. Because I know people often think that they have a complete comprehension of this thing that we call marriage. which really is, bottom line, a contract between you and God. You see, the contract isn't just between you and your spouse. The contract isn't just between you and the state that you live in. The contract isn't just between you and the land that you live in. But the contract, what a marriage really is, is what you're making between you, another person, and God. So you see, there's three parts to marriage. Now, the interesting thing is that this part is left out. Oh, we involve God when we want to accept you know, the ceremony, but the responsibility often gets left behind. Because all these areas that we talk about in marriage, whether it be the ceremony, the responsibility, or all the other seven different areas that I like to talk about in marriage that you should be, and they're not just the financial or those kind of things, but the areas that most people won't talk about. Sexuality is one of them. But the point being is this, the simplest principle about all of this, whether it be the contract, how your contract has certain parts that you and God fulfill, your contract has certain parts that your spouse and God fulfills, the contract has certain parts that you and your spouse fulfill, each one of you has parts of a contractual agreement that you have made before God in order to say that you will do this and he will do this. You will do this, and she or he will do this. So, whenever you break a contract, whoa! What do you do then? Here's how you keep a marriage together. And this is the most important part that I wanted to bring out real quick. Just a short one. This is something that most people don't realize. What are you looking at? If you're looking at God, you've got the right answer. You see, when you look at God from the perspective of a triangle, you can only see 
this person by looking through God at them. You see what I mean? Everything else is blocking it. Because in this triangle, it's called life. And life is going to change your perspective. The way you look at things when you look through life will affect the way you look at your spouse. If you're far away from your spouse, if you're very distant and not very close to your spouse, there's a good reason. You're not very close to God. You see, the closer you get to God, the easier it is to get close to your spouse. But if your spouse isn't getting closer to God, you're not getting any closer to each other. Do you see how there's parts of this contractual agreement that must be in play? It's not just your fault, and it's not just her fault, and it's not just his fault. But it has to all cooperate together, because she has to be looking through God at you, because God knows, why would she marry you otherwise? You have to be looking through God at her, because God knows you only want one thing from her anyway, so you got to learn how to repent of that and get right with God so that you can get real with your marriage. So the reality of marriage, when we talk about it, is always based upon this triangular principle. Or, I like to say it this way, the tripart aspect of God himself. God has a purpose and a design for marriage. And it was to reveal the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. And in every part of your marriage, if you could learn to see it from three perspectives, which was, which is, which shall be, or Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and apply those characteristics to it, your marriage will not only last, but it will become a testimony and a witness to the people around you. Because this is what God intended from the beginning. Now, where we've come from since then is really the greatest challenge in the world. Because each one of us may be, at some point in our life, somewhere along these lines. You see, this may be you. You may be very much seeking to go after God. In your life right now, you may be all absorbed with seeking God. And this person may be all absorbed with seeking a spouse. Notice the difference? Kind of a obtuse triangle, isn't it? Very fascinating how that can be. Now, maybe you're up here, and maybe the person's down here. Interesting, isn't it? You're still far apart. aren't you? Even though you're close to God, you're still far apart. So you see, there seems to be the necessity of bringing balance into a marriage. If you bring balance into the marriage, then here's what's going to happen in your marriage. When you bring balance into marriage, the triangular part is still there. That's how you communicate, c communicate, cooperate, and coordinate your marriage. But when you bring the balance into it, with God in the middle, and you both reached that plateau, so to speak, you become one. That's the goal. You know, not physical oneness, not spiritual oneness, not emotional oneness, but one. Just one. Because after all, the Father and the Son and the Spirit are one. So, our goal in teaching the marriage aspect of coming to that place and that conclusion of what God intended marriage to be is that the two shall become one. We know that the two shall become one flesh, but God wants us to become one in Him. And that's what marriage is all about. So I just wanted to put that shameless plug in and kind of tantalize or remind people of that, which is in medieval marriage, that triangular principle that we've always been teaching about and that we always apply you know, to any type of relationship. Whenever you want to deal with communication, believe it or not, you can use the triangle principle. How far you are apart, the distance right here of where you are as far as cooperation, communication, communication, and understanding is determined by the relationship that you have and how close you are to an intermediary, whether it be God, the Holy Spirit, whether it be a third-party person, or whether it be communication. You can change these particulars in some ways, 
But everything in life really boils down to three parts. Would you think? <laughs> well, we won't go there. But anyways, getting back to Vidivo Tozer teaching, which is what we wanted to share with you. Who sets the moral pace for us today? Funny how that fits you know, into marriage, doesn't it? Hmm. <laughs> Odd. I guess maybe we had this cooperation going between God and I and, you know, you. See, God, you and me. Well, it seems to be a cooperative effort here. For even hereunto were you called, because Jesus also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow in his steps. 1 Peter 2.21 The history of Israel and Judah points to a truth taught clearly enough by all history, that the masses are, or soon will be, what their leaders are. The kings set the moral pace for the people. Israel sometimes rebelled against her leaders. It is true, but the rebellions were not spontaneous. The people merely switched to a new leader and followed him. The point is, they always had to have a leader. Whatever sort of man the king turned out to be, the people were soon following his leadership. They followed David in the worship of Jehovah. Solomon in the building of the temple, Jeroboam in the making of a calf, Hezekiah in the restoration of the temple worship. It is not complimentary to the masses that they are so easily led, but we are not interested in praising or blaming. We are concerned for truth. And the truth is that for better or for worse, religious people follow leaders. A good man may change the moral complexion of a whole nation, or a corrupt and worldly clergy may lead a nation into bondage. The transposed proverb, like priest, like people, sum up in four words a truth taught plainly in the scripture and demonstrated again and again in religious history. The rewards of godly leadership are so great that the responsibility of the leader is so heavy that no one can afford to take the matter lightly. In the modern world, most people like to blame someone rather than involve themselves in changing someone. They like to blame someone in charge and say, they caused me to do something, kind of like the old devil made me do it, than to pray for or encourage leadership to be moral and to be responsible. In this, one of the aspects that we teach is to look through what God is doing so that you understand what leadership's purpose and design is. Often, as Tozer is teaching, yes, the way that a leader is, is the way that the people are. So a lot of times when you want to find your own sin, all you have to do is look at the sin of the leader and you'll find yourself in the same sin. Not because you're or they're so wicked, but because you're so human, you're likened unto them. And the spirit that influenced them influences you. So we have to find ourselves somewhere, this medium, where we bring up as it were, if we were talking about the masses and Tozer's teaching, we have to bring the leader up likewise as we bring ourselves up. So you don't lift up one or the other and kind of make a teeter-totter, but you bring up the standard of both leader and follower. So that way you were causing, or Jesus did in his disciples, but you're causing the leader to rise up to the occasion of leadership that he can manage by way of keeping his focus in the right place. And the people, when they keep their focus on God, then God changes the leadership. Because it says also in the scriptures that the king's heart is turned whithersoever will that he chooses. That God can change the leadership by removing him, because it says that God puts all leaders into leadership. Or he can change their heart to make them softened or turned towards the needs of the people. So we have an opportunity always in prayer and always in our relationship with God to change things if we're willing to do that. But you see, in order to change one person or the other, that means we have to change ourselves as well as change our perspective to see what really we're doing. Because it's easy and very easy to be this way. And when two people are heading at each other, guess what? They can't go any farther. They're too busy running into each other 
than moving forward in a positive direction. The same thing is true with people, leaders, and leadership.